الرحمن الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما واجعل التفرق بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تدع فينا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم امين in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most compassionate the most merciful all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessings be upon his beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he who is guided by the will of Allah, no one can misguide him. And he who is misguided, no one can guide him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. طبعاً, uh, maybe some of you did not pray the Hayyakum Allah, Sister Sidra, long time no see. Are you? Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Brother Naeem, the one who's uh, always helping us in recording, uh, his father passed away today. So make a dua for him. Jazakumullahu khairan. Type. Now, last time still, we are dealing with the details of the battle of Uhud. In case we have a, a, a new faces, ahlan wa sahlan, you are most welcome. Now, we are in the third year historically of the existence in al Medina after the migration of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Sahaba. So we are in the year 16 out of 23 of the age of Islam at the time of Prophet Muhammad After we covered generally the first 13 years what happened there, we moved to al Medina. We started talking about the first six months, the changing of the Qibla, the Masjid Qiba, the establishment of the Masjid, the covenant of al Medina, or the special agreements between the people of al Medina. Then we spoke about Badr for many weeks, the details, how they were trying to preserve or return back some of their stolen money and properties and how Allah decreed that the battle happened and then subhanallah they were defeated in a way which was completely unexpected okay because just a simple humble number of poor barefoot people 313 person they defeated an army of 1000 well equipped soldier and the pride that they used to have and the power the mighty they were not expecting not even a big army to do it. It happened. So they decided to take revenge. I mean, the people of Mecca against the new emerged Islamic State at Al Medina by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Uhud happened. So we are in our, I think, fifth week of talking about the battle of Uhud, how it happened. They knew that they are coming. Now the numbers, they were 1,000 versus 3,000. And at the very beginning, a big issue happened. The people, they did not realize it, how the hikmah, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an army represents a big city. Muslims, they were still little. The 1,000, after they started moving, about 300 of them, they withdrew. They were the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. Just, they want to destroy it, uniform foundation. Can you imagine at the time of war? Can you imagine yourself now? Imagine, imagine, yeah, yeah, I mean, just to imagine how difficult it is. Now we are living in Canada. Imagine, for example, God forbid, China decided to attack Canada. Imagine that the Canadian army is one million soldier. Supposedly, one million loyal soldier, they want to defend Canada against China. When they were about to prepare to war, 300,000 Canadians they declare that they are against the war and they withdraw from the army. Do you know what does this ha What will this cause? Full destruction of the country. It's finished. <laughs> yeah, so think it in our today's numbers and our ways of understanding. It's, it's, it's a big trouble. Subhanallah. Now the people, but look, what happened? Quran came. Allah knows the ghaib. قال ما كان الله ليذر المؤمنين على ما أنتم عليه حتى يميز الخبيث من الطيب. By the way, this ayah, Allah will not leave the believers on what they on the status that they are until He distinguished between good and evil. By the way, this incident in specific where the ayah was revealed, this is exactly because Muslims at the very beginning they say. But how we are going to fight? We lost 
third this is the evil third this is the dirty part of your group <laughs> you don't need them <laughs> they are not supposed to be with you <laughs> so subhanallah this happened now after the battle I'm just because I, I, I see new faces hello sahlan taban hiyakum Allah sister sister Fatima ahlan sahlan fiki and I think ah ahlan sahlan hiyakum Allah my brother from now ahlan sahlan fiki I'm trying to welcome the new faces the others are not the new faces ahlan sahlan hiyakum Allah fa we did all of this now last time last two times we were highlighting some of the very beautiful incidents of the big heroes of Islam the martyrs the shuhada last time we highlighted Mus'ab bin Umair and Abdullah bin Jahsh if you remember Mus'ab bin Umair we finished last time with those two uh, persons Mus'ab bin Umair uh, was one of the richest youth people of Mecca <laughs> And he became the first ambassador of Islam at Al-Madinah. According to the best of my memory and my reading, he was around 24, 25, 26. Can you imagine? He was representing Islam. He was not a prophet. <laughs> he was just an ordinary person. He decided to accept this faith. In one year, he managed to spread Islam in Al-Madinah to a degree he came after Bay'at al aqaba Do you remember? He came to Prophet Muhammad and said, Ya Rasulullah, Taraktu al-Madina ta walaysa fiha baytun illa wa dakhalahu al-Islam. There is not even one single house, but there's someone has accepted Islam. One young man who used to be very rich, he decided to leave all kind of wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this Mus'ab who did that, and he left with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to Al-Madina. In the third year, as a still young man, he was killed. Now, why we highlighted his story? Very rich in our, in our uh, terminology, he was a, a young multimillionaire. <laughs> you know, every, let's say, every age, every time, every place has their own style of luxurious life. In our language today, He's like someone who was born for a very rich family. He has two Ferraris, two Bentley, three Rolls Royce. He can travel wherever. Full bank account, tens of millions. He can go skydiving, <laughs> skiing, swimming, Caribbeans, Hawaii, wherever, whenever. Okay? Can you imagine someone with all of, and he is able to do anything, anytime, Anywhere, then he decides to come to the masjid and to be submissive to Allah and to stop drinking alcohol, committing zina, or having a girlfriend, or blah blah blah. All of these things that rich people easily can, you know, approach without any kind of obstacles. Because, by, by the way, just pause my personal opinion. I will say something my personal, it's not an Islamic opinion. You know, we have fitna by all time we are tested with poverty and with wealth and richness true or false it's a test i personally think the fitna the test of the rich is much more stronger and difficult than the fitna of the poor it's my personal opinion because simple, the poor needs to be patient but what what other why does he have Nothing except patience. <laughs> Rich, he's able to do everything. Can you imagine everything is under your control and you stop it? <laughs> it's like, for example, when I ask you to fast and it happened that you can't buy food. <laughs> you don't have money to buy food. And you were fasting. Uh, in parallel, it goes with this, alhamdulillah, <laughs> double edger type. If you have all kind of beautiful, tasty, best food on earth in your house, and the smell goes into your khayshum inside, and it hits, 
your mind and your hearts and you are hungry and it's all in your house under your control <laughs> and it's for you <laughs> and you are alone and you were told please don't eat <laughs> can you well the smell of the coffee itself just I will not mention the msakhan or the mansaf or the tandoori or the chicken butter. I will not mention the kunafa or the ice cream or the cheesecake. Or the, everything is under your control and you are hungry and the food is yours. Can you imagine how difficult it is to take a decision not to eat? Anyway, I'm just giving, I, I want just to highlight the difficulty that Mus'ab was facing when he took this decision. So he passed away. Why we need this? Because when they wanted to bury him, they did not find a piece of cloth to do kafan for him, more than covering part of his body. If they covered his foot, his face was uncovered. <laughs> to that degree, which means he was, they found nothing. He does not ever have, you know, uh, an enough pieces of clothes just to cover even his body, just to be buried. This is a message. Another one, Abdullah bin Jash, the one who made like a covenant. Al he, he was not able to witness, do you remember? He was not able to witness Badr. <laughs> and he said, I promise you, Ya Allah, if I attended another battle, you will see what I will do. Uh, he was fighting, defending the Prophet and Islam to a degree. They could not recognize who is he except from his thumbnail, his sister recognized his finger, which means they hit him in their spears and swords in his face. He lost completely the features of his face. No one was able to recognize who is he. But last time, now that's what happened last time. The, 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 the big highlight message last time I did was be careful when we speak about, we are talking about history now. It's part of our history and our identity. In this time, when you speak about the, the martyrship and fighting and uh, jihad and something, you know, the mainstream media in these times, they misuse this terminology and might accuse you as a Muslim. Why you are speaking about this? You know, this fighting and jihad and so Say, wait, 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 wait. Pause, let's come now. Now, all countries, do they have armies or not? Do we have, as countries, soldiers or not? Yes or no? Do they fight or not? Do they fight? Do they kill and they are killed or not? Do we consider them heroes defending their lands or not? Don't we have special forces? Yes or no? Commandos, special forces, SWAT teams, private whatever, patients, they have, we call them soldiers. And when they are killed for the sake of protecting a piece of land, which we call it country, we call them heroes. What's the difference? What's the difference? Any difference? So if someone is about to, you know, you know, you say, excuse me, what, what, what do you mean by you know? All nations, they have this during the history, up to this moment now. Show me one country that wants to defend its honor with the minimum without an army. One country. This is the norm. <laughs> Fighting to defend yourself, it's, it's the minimum of existence. What was about? Because, you know, media works sometimes, might make some Muslims even afraid to talk about their history. <laughs> Not discussing nowadays, even the history. But for, be careful. This is part of it. You need to be proud of your ancestors. They were defending themselves, they were defending now. If anyone wants to discuss, you know what to excuse me, excuse me, sir. <laughs> if you want to see something wrong in that, let's discuss what happens now. Regard, uh, look at the, the speaker, ask him which country you are from. Do you have an army or not? Your army, do they fight? Everyone wants to attack them or not? Do you consider them heroes when they are killed? Okay. You consider them heroes, and we consider them martyrs. <laughs> That's it. And last time we finished, if you remember, we highlighted the final message. People, they are ready to sacrifice their souls for their countries. True or false? 
Russians, for the sake of defending themselves against German Nazism in the Second World War, if I'm not mistaken, just to defend two cities, which is Stalingrad and Leningrad. Okay, Stalingrad and Leningrad. Now they have, a, I think, St. Petrosberg now. These two cities, to defend them against the German Nazis, if I'm not mistaken, they, they lost two cities. I'm not talking about Russia. Just for two cities, between 12 to 25 millions. Can you imagine this? Defending two cities. If, we, if I want to argue with them, as a, someone from the Middle East, I could have said, give this to... The, does the value of losing 20 million Russians equal to its two cities? Yeah, I'm give these two cities for the Germans and let's finish it. They say, no, 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 no. It's a war of defending our existence against the enemy. <laughs> Type, Vietnamese. They were under the American occupation from 1955 to 1967, if I'm not mistaken, around 12, 15 years, I forgot. They lost while trying to let the Americans leave their countries. They lost, I think, four millions. <laughs> they were showered by the American airplanes, literally, I'm quoting now a BBC documentary, literally. They were showered with 26 million tons of chemical weapons equal to four atomic bomb nowadays. Yet, they did not give up. <laughs> so if someone wants to ask or to understand the context of the expansion of Muslims in their time while defending themselves against their enemies at that time, the people of Mecca, the non-believers who kicked them out of their country, okay? And they wanted to protect themselves, just discuss the nowadays context. If you think that's wrong, tell me about your country now. What do you think? If that's wrong, this is wrong. <laughs> if you want to condemn, let's condemn together, yalla, both. <laughs> Declare it if you are a man. <laughs> or you want just to pick and choose. I'm just highlighting, you know, because here we are not here just to, to have a, an extra data. No, no, no. This is part of your history, part of your identity. If you are not aware about how things happened historically, Anyone can defeat you psychologically, intellectually, while well, telling you, look, you will look down to yourself, you will might be facing what we call the inferiority complex. You know this? This mean naqs. Inferiority, you have superior and inferior. Okay? So, when you feel that you are inferior. You feel you are down, you are less, and the one who is against you is better than everything. When you look at yourself, you will ask, accept any accusations, you can't defend anything, you will lose yourself in a brief. So be careful. One of the ways how to get into your software to defeat you by the inferiority complex, to miss quote the context of your history and to attack you by your historical identity. <laughs> so understand the context. One of the academic ways to defend your culture and your history to compare it with others. Simply, if I will not argue this, is, this happened, okay. If this is wrong, what do you think about this? <laughs> or you just pick and choose I'm speaking about the mainstream media now, because, you know, mainstream media, they are professional in this. They see with one eye. <laughs> they always close the other eye. Just one side. The side that they decide for their benefits, political benefits, intellectual benefits, whatever benefits. Right. This was the big context of our today. We will be highlighting one or two of the Sahaba as well. Type. Right. Now, uh, we have a, 
a very beautiful story about Abdullah bin Haram. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best not to give you a lot of details every time. So that you leave for a full week, you have one or two just in your mind. Grasp them, get into them, into your system. Abdullah bin Haram, Abu Jabir, the father bin Jabir bin Abdullah, two great of the Sahaba. Abdullah bin Haram, we will read what his son Jabir said about his death in the battle of Uhud. Now Abdullah bin Haram was the first one who was killed in Uhud. First, number one. Now the amazing thing about his story is the following. Look. قال لما قتل أبي يوم أحد now the narrator is the son which is جابر قال لما قتل أبي يوم أحد جعلت أكشف عن وجهه وأبكي he said when my you know after they everything is finished because they lost seventy of the صحابة سبعين شهيد seventy martyrs it's a big big number seventy out of seven hundred big صحابة so Jabir, when everything settled down, his father was dead. He was laid on the ground. So he came, he started crying as a normal reaction <laughs> for any son or daughter for his father. So he started crying. They covered his face. So he uncovered his face and started crying. He said, it was something strange that the Sahaba, they, they kept telling me, stop it, don't cry, don't cry, yes, inshallah, he's a shaheed, yani, don't worry, mashallah, your father, something. they were trying just, you know, to ask me to stop showing this kind of sadness. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say anything. قَالُهُ لَا يَنْهَانِ He was not telling me, stop it, don't do it. He just kept silent. قَالْ وَجَعَلَتْ عَمَّتِي تَبْكِيهِ His aunt, which means the sister of the deceased, she was crying as well. So both, sister and the son, both of them, they are crying. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not saying anything. Then, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, قَالْ تَبْكِيهِ أَوْ لَا تَبْكِيهِ مَا زَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ تُظَلِّلُهُ بِأَجْنِحَتِهَا حَتَّى رَفَعْتُمُهُ He said, whether you cried or you did not cry, he was under the cover of the wings of the angels till you took him back to bury him. It's an expression of, and by the way, Prophet did not say this for all those who were killed in Uhud. Jabir, he has something exceptional. Allah knows what is it. A group of angels, as a sign of honoring him, they came and Prophet saw him they were so big in a number that they covered the area, you know, above him. It's a sign of honor. It's like just to make it easy in our language. Just when you are invited to a very great king in this worldly life, when the very special honorary or private, let's say, say special forces, they welcome you with their full weapons. What it says, yes, sir, you are most welcome. You know, at the, for example. Uh, uh, doorstep, for example, of the uh, plane that you are traveling from with the red carpet, you know, those special, you know, guards, like the uh, honor guards. Guard of honor? They call them the guards of honor. Haras Sharaf, okay? It's exactly something like that. Allah sends a special malaika for him. It's narrated by Al Bukhari. Someone say, how did we know? We did not know. Prophet Muhammad told us. <laughs> okay, it's, it's part of the wahi. It's part of the revelation. So this is the ma'ak. Now the other, the other, uh, Abdullah bin Haram, the father of Jabir. He narrates as well. He says in another narration. قال أرجو أن أكون, he said, قال, uh, he said, my father called me one night before the battle of Uhud. Just the night before the start of the battle. قال دعاني والدي. Which means Abdullah bin Haram called Jabir, the narrator. He said, my father called me the night before the morning of the battle. 
قال له أرجو أن أكون في أول من يصاب غدا I hope I will be from the first who will be killed tomorrow talk about himself he had the feeling he did not know that Allah made him saying that he was the first one to be a martyr قال أرجو أن أكون أو في, في أول من يصاب I hope I will be the first as an honor that I'm ready to sacrifice myself for the sake of this deen قال فأوصيك ببناتي خيرا I ask you to take care of your sisters my daughters because he had a lot of daughters and one son which is Jabir so one father one son a lot of daughters قال أوصيك ببناتي take care of your sisters فأصيب جابر continues قال فأصيب he was killed as a martyr قال فدفنته مع آخر so they were in a hurry it was very difficult to bury because by the way you know at that time they did not have the tools that we have it's not something you use this kind of machines and easy things up. I mean to, to dig you know a grave for someone it could take you hours so sometimes when you have 70 killed, they have to do it sometimes as a collective grave. He said, قَالْ فَدَفَنْتُهُ مَعَ آخَرِ So I had to bury my father with someone else. In another narrator, this someone else is, is Amr ibn Jamuh. He has another story. <laughs> okay? So قَالْ فَدَفَنْتُهُ with another man. So I buried him with another man. Because, but for whatever reason. قال فلم تبعني نفسي حتى استخرج استخرجته ودفنته وحده بعد ستة أشهر. He said I kept feeling guilt why I did not put special efforts to bury a special grave just for my father. I kept having this kind of feeling of guilt for six months. I returned back six months. And you know, generally speaking, most of pieces of lands on earth, after a few days and weeks, the, the, the body will start what they call it the, the, the decomposition of the body. You know, it will start the decomposition because of, you know, the, the nature. It's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. In very, very exceptional areas, very cold areas, I don't know, they might not. I anyway, mean, this is the normal most of the places on the earth. And in very hot places, it is more weeks and months, the body is disappeared. I'm talking about the flesh. Okay, uh, you know, it will disappear. He came after six months. And we know how hot that area is. It's about 50 Celsius normal. <laughs> 50. I came after six months. حتى استخرجت تلع I took him out and I buried him أنا وسكر قال فإذا الأرض لم تأكل منه شيئا إلا بعد شحمة أذنه I said his body was not touched except just a simple part of his ear in another narration this hit was by a weapon in the battle it's not because of the burying which means six months under the ground, his body was completely untouched. And in another narration, his hand was in a, one of the injuries bleeding. When they just moved it, the blood came. How? It's part of what Allah gives for some martyrs as a sign of honor. Just to show the people part of, you know, Al-Ghayb. Wallahu alam. So this is uh, Abdullah bin Haram, which is the father uh, uh, of Jabir radiallahu anhu. Now, the, the, other, the other one, which I will finish, inshallah, uh, my talk today about him, قال, well, it's Am, Amr ibn al-Jamuh. Amr ibn al-Jamuh is the second one who was in the same grave. Amr ibn al-Jamuh, he has a very interesting story as well. Amr ibn al-Jamuh, it was narrated in اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد إن إن الصحيح حديث that he said for Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he was a lame man you know you know lame he can't walk steadily look like this when he walks you see because he has a problem in his leg so basically at that time maybe now it does not make a big difference if he's uh, if he's driving a tank or a airplane <laughs> at that time it does make a difference because the people they were fighting on their foot
walk, if you can't run, if you can't, it's, it's, a, it's a big defect against you, you could be killed easily. So, and they are, those people got excused, excused from the battle itself. So he was approaching as if he was prevented, which means, I mean, you are excused. Just to stay at home and thank you, because he can't walk properly. He said to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I was killed for the sake of defending my religion, am I gonna step the Jannah with my arja, with my limb leg? <laughs> Which means, I mean, I don't care what the end result. Am I gonna be rewarded by going to the Jannah? قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he said yes قال فوالذي بعثك بالحق لا أطأن بها الجنة اليوم إن شاء الله ثم قاتل حتى قتل he said I swear by the one who sent you with truth which means it's one of the uh, uh, expressions how we swear by Allah سبحانه وتعالى والذي بعثك بالحق آه والذي نفسي بيده والذي أرسل إبراهيم والذي خلق السماوات والأرض all of these expressions they are expressions of Swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال, والذي, by the one who sent you with the truth. I will stand, you know, leg on the ground of the Jannah. Which means, and by the way, he will not be disabled when he goes to the Jannah. Because he will have a complete, the same soul, but a new body. Okay? He will be completely enjoying. But it's an expression which means, even if I stay like this, I want to go. It's an expression of showing certainty about his faith and his determination that I want to do my job, which means to sacrifice myself to defend my people and my group and my land and my honor and my existence and, 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 you know, etc. as a Muslim. In the first day, he fought. Now, all of these stories gives you an idea about the power of faith. When they believe in something. Some of them, he was excused not to fight. Yet, yet, he insisted to go. The other one, so, so rich. <laughs> Jabir, Abdullah bin Haram, he could have asked Prophet Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, I have many girls, I have many daughters. And by the way, life at that time was not easy like ours now. If a man passes away now, if his daughters in general, two of them works, they can drive, they can everything, transportation, easy, they have bank accounts, they have credit card, they can buy through them. At that time, the power of the hand man to defend and to go and to carry and to hold and to fight, if it does not exist, the woman easily will be vanished and demolished. It, literally, literally traveling, now, traveling without a man, a woman could be killed or kidnapped 100%. Because it's a matter of fighting with sword and uh, spear. Generally, a woman cannot fight, you know, a man with a sword, generally. <laughs> and mainly, when they used to fight these tri tribal fights, al Ghazu, okay? The, the best thing that they used to kidnap kids and uh, women. This is part of the norm. And you used to be slave girls. So without, you know, men, women, they are lost. Maybe feminism has another way now because of the new technology. But I'm talking about historical events now, okay? Now you say, we have a strong, independent woman, alhamdulillah. No problem. Okay, but who will do the difficult job outside? Definitely, <laughs> not women. <laughs> You know, like I said, for example, they, they ask always, in Islam we have justice, not equality. Because equality could lead to injustice in many cases. Are you with me? Yes, because during the history, up to this moment, the most difficult jobs are done by the harsh, the tough, the big construction, the mega projects, the constructions, the roads, the mines. Who do these jobs? Have you ever seen a feminist fighting because she wants to do uh, the construction of the highway? I'm asking. Have you ever? They are seeking equality. Why they don't fight to work in mines? 
to bring gold from mines. Go 500 meters inside. Why, why not? It is equal to... They don't do it. <laughs> anyway, but just, I mean, why I'm, I'm saying that? Because literally, literally, if, if you put yourself in the place of Abdullah, I, I want you to understand the historical context. At that time, if, if Abdullah bin Haram, the father of Jabir, because he, I forget how many daughters, maybe six of them, even Jabir radiallahu anhu, when he wanted to marry, he was looking for a divorced or a widow to help him to take care of his sisters. <laughs> Because he's not able to take care of sisters, they were left. The idea, if Abdullah bin Haram thought for a while, who will take care of? Ya Rasulullah, do you give me an excuse because I have uh, six daughters? Most likely he will give him an excuse. With my point? So, we have, uh, I'm just trying to highlight the psychology, the inner psychology of their way of thinking and taking decisions. But what kind of benefit we might have to make the analogy in our deluxe? Because sometimes everyone has his own challenges in his life. Um, it's not necessarily, we are not facing the same, but the core point could be the same, depending on your situation. This to give you the level of certainty and power and strong and steadfasting on the path of Iman that they decided to follow. Type. By this, today's session is finished. We will continue with the Battle of Uhud. Just to remind you, tomorrow we will not have Tafsir session because at the same time we will do the Aza, the condolence for the father of uh, uh, Brother Naim. So, okay, you are most welcome definitely to come, but please to pay the, uh, the, the condolence for Brother Naim, inshallah, for his father. Zakumullah khair. But there is no Tafsir session tomorrow. السلام عليكم جزاكم الله خيرا